I'm Ann Campbell, um, adult programmer and librarian at the Groton Public Library. I'm watching to see if people are coming to come in. Um, and I don't know where she is on your screen, but Kara, wave your hand, Kara. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> and Kara. Incredibly creative, brilliant coworker. Um, and she has collaborated with me to present this program with Debbie, who's the artist who was gonna lead us through some calligraphy. Um, you wanna start, Debbie? You've got a lot, I know you've got a lot. Okay, I've got a lot. I'm going to keep you busy for the next 90 minutes. So okay, I will get every right. minute I can so get. I have my water. You can have whatever you want in your preference in your own living rooms. Um, but I want to introduce Debbie Relitz, mm -hmm. uh, who is a calligrapher she, with over 20 years of professional experience. She's been teaching for 16, doing in person programming, and now the online programming. She is living in North Granbury, uh, North, North Granby. Uh, did go to school in Gales Ferry and was inspired by her teacher there to pick up calligraphy and letteringdesign.com is her website. And I'm going to turn the program over to Debbie at this point and watch for people coming in. So thank you all for coming and let's have at it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me um, or just taking the time to join with me. Um, I've been doing lettering for a long time now, and it's always a joy to be able to share the experience and the skill um, because no matter who we are, letters surround us. You know, it's just part of our culture. And so to be able to present letters in a meaningful way that um, conveys your love and your caring and um, your concern for others and for yourself. It's an incredible blessing. And I often get the question, how can you be callig a calligrapher in this techie age? You know, um, because I can do things on the computer. I don't need to do it by hand. And there is a, you know, on the surface, it seems like, well, yeah, how do I make a living off of it? And a big part of it is just that nothing that I hit print on and send it through those rollers and comes out the machine, no matter what they do with that machine, it's never going to have the energy, the vibrancy of real paint or real pigment it's not going to have that love that has come from my hands and my heart that goes into a project. And to me, that's what keeps lettering, hand lettering alive is because um, no machine can replace that. Um, I was just really, really, really fortunate that my fifth grade teacher, um, Mrs. Simpson at Juliet W. Long in Gales Ferry <laughs> introduced me to calligraphy when I was in fifth grade. They realized that on Friday afternoons, the attention level wasn't very good. So they decided let the kids do something fun. So I think I did macrame in one six week session, calligraphy on another, maybe soccer on another, but um, the calligraphy definitely stuck. And it stuck not just because of the instruction. So there was my teacher who got me started, but there was a rather, another really key player. And that was my mom. Because once she realized I could, I was getting started with calligraphy <laughs> and she was very you know, active in the community. She helped lead our 4-H club. She would give me projects. She'd be like, oh, here, Debbie, we've got these 4-H certificates that need to be filled in. Um, for your, your fellow members. And she'd give me, I need this thank you card done, or I need this quote done. And so by having me do projects, she might not have realized it at the time, but she did a huge amount to develop my learning curve and my desire to stick with the calligraphy. So I've always been, 
extremely grateful to both my mom and to my fifth grade teacher because if it weren't for the projects, I don't know if I would have developed as a calligrapher. And because practice is great, but if you don't have a reason to use your letters, chances are you might not stick with it. Um, so that's why in the course of the class, you're gonna be hearing from me about ways to use the lettering that you're getting exposed to tonight. Um, so just keep that in mind. Just think about ways that you can continue to use the lettering, even if you find it hard, but I'll get back to that. All right, so um, modern calligraphy, it's kind of everywhere. Um, and let's see here. So I pulled out some, some kind of common samples. Here was a postcard I received from Habitat for Humanity in Hartford. And you've got thicks and then you've got thins. You've got thicks and then you've got thins. In this case, it's a cursive style where the letters are connected. That's the style we're gonna talk about tonight in the program, but that doesn't mean you have to do it with connected letters, okay? So that's a sample, you know, Whenever the holiday cards start showing up, I see a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of modern calligraphy where we get the thicks and we get the thins. This is clearly a different variation than the one we just had. Here's another lovely example where we have the thicks and then we have the thins, thicks and thins. Um, and then even on this back wall, I, I was really, really, really lucky last summer. I got a commission from a church in Bethel, Connecticut, and they wanted to do a couple Bible verses in their vestibule. And so, and it was 15 feet up on the wall. So normally when I'm writing, I'm looking down at a page and I am, you know, tend to be writing small, or in a, um, uh, with a metal nib and ink. But the fun part about modern calligraphy is that there's several tools you can use in order to make the modern calligraphy. You know, one of my, what we'll be using tonight is a brush marker. You might have a slightly different brand than I do, but it's got the pointed tip to the brush. We've got a good old pointed paintbrush that you can do the modern calligraphy with. Modern calligraphy is also a lot of fun with just good old pencil where you're drawing it. There's all sorts of design techniques that you can use just by drawing the modern calligraphy. And then just another version of the brush. This is called a water brush. It's available at almost all craft stores. And one of the reasons why this is kind of my favorite tool for the modern calligraphy is that I've had this brush for about 15 years now, 10 to 15 years. And it's been so durable and wonderful that I'm still using it. Um, and I try to reduce my plastic as much as possible. So I like the fact that I can reuse something um, you know, this is an awesome thing. And you guys are so lucky to have a library that has invested in you guys and gotten these resources for you. Um, and so this is a great starter tool for it. Okay, so the nice thing is, is that the modern calligraphy can be done with lots of different tools. So as you can imagine, doing something large enough to go on a wall and to be seen from a distance away, I would be using something like the a brush, okay? And the thing about this lettering, let's see if I can, is that it's got those same characteristics where we have our thick and then we have our thin. We have our thick and then our thins, all right? All throughout the lettering. So that's kind of giving you a glimmer of the basic skill that's part of the modern calligraphy. Now, 
I know you guys are all eager to start lettering, but I'm gonna take a slight detour, okay? All right. Can you guys see what that says on the book? Feel free to unmute and tell me if you can tell. Let's say autographs. Yes. Okay. It's an <laughs> autograph book. Okay. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when I was a little girl, I had an autograph book. It wasn't. It wasn't nearly as beautiful as this one is. Um, but I had my friend sign it. I had my teacher sign it. Um, I even think I took it to Disney World and I think I've got a goofy signature in that photograph book. <laughs> and it might still be somewhere in my stash of memory boxes. Um, but this is a really special autograph book and I'm gonna just show you three or four pages. But, um, Hopefully you're getting some, this is um, kind of the page that describes what the autograph book is about. And it's an autograph book of fellow students at a business college in upstate New York. And you can even see that they've come from all across the country. There's some Connecticut, there's some territories, you know, there's, um, a really a variety of different places that people have come from. But here is a autograph page. This is a page where it's really dark. And can anybody see the date on it? Eighteen ninety seven. 1877. 1877. Yeah, 1877. And I, when I first realized how old this book was, I just was beside myself. But these are business students. And in order to succeed in business, you had to have beautiful handwriting or you were expected to have beautiful handwriting. And as you can see from this, this lettering from 1877, that they have thicks and they have thins. They have thicks and they have thins, okay? So even though the class you're having tonight is called Modern Calligraphy, just keep in mind <laughs> that the skills you guys are gonna be using have been part of the calligraphic tradition for a very long time for centuries. Um, so I just like, thank you for indulging my little detour, um, but I just love it because it helps us connect that even though we're using a contemporary tool, we are tapping into traditions that have been um, around for a very, very long time. And the fact that business people, you know, could have done their lettering much more simply, gotten the work done, lickety split. They still were concerned with beauty and beauty was valuable for business. And I think that that's a lesson in our very, you know, let's get it done kind of world um, is a great reminder that beauty does matter um, for it. All right, now I know you wanna dive in. So I'm gonna change my camera angle Okay, and we're gonna get started. Please forgive me, I'm a gardener and I tend to be forgetful about cleaning my fingernails. So <laughs> I'm realizing that just pretend it's, it's brown nail polish or something. <laughs> All right, so with the modern calligraphy, we talked about the thicks and the thins with the class with the lettering style. And which means that for the modern calligraphy, there's actually three skills that we need to have, we're gonna develop. One is a full pressure stroke, a no pressure stroke, and then what's called a taper stroke, okay? The two easier strokes are the full pressure and the no pressure. 
the harder stroke is the taper stroke. So we're going to forget about that one for a little bit. And we're gonna just focus on the first two skills. Um, full pressure, no pressure. All right, so what does that look like? When I am, first off, I wanna just talk a little bit about holding a pen. And today's day and age, there's not a lot of attention being paid to how to hold a pen or a pencil. And so over the years, I've seen everything, you know, all sorts of, you know, hand holds over the years. And I am a huge fan of the traditional, you know, um, one boss on the pen. I'm a self-employed person and I know having myself is a boss is hard enough. I don't want any additional bosses. I don't know about you guys out there, but um, one boss is plenty. But if I hold the pen like this, I actually have four bosses. I've got this one that's wrapped around it, and then I've got three more. I still have three bosses. I want to get down to one boss on my pen. So I put my control finger, that means I only have to develop the fine motor skill in this finger. My thumb just becomes a pivot, pivot point. And then my middle finger is just a resting spot, okay? But it's amazing how calligraphy is really all about fine motor control. All right, so we've got our three skills. And we talked about how to hold the pen. The other things is that we wanna talk about where to point the nib, okay? So in this case, we want to point it to the, um, the left side of the paper in order to do the full pressure stroke. So I'm going to press, pull, and then release. And I know that seems so ridiculously easy, but there's a couple things I want to tell you is that one, just um, leave your superpowers behind tonight and you don't need to press too hard on the marker, okay? Just a little bit of pressure will be able to get that con um, consistent thick line. The other thing you want to make sure you do is that you um, have a very deliberate start and a deliberate stop to your letter. If I go, you know, quickly and not deliberately, I'm gonna get a different size here than I am here, okay? So um, that's a, another important thing. The other things you're not, I want you to slide your hand. If I try doing it just from my fingers, it can again be very hard to get a consistent width, okay? So you do want to move the whole way down, okay? All right, so we have the full pressure stroke. The other stroke, now if you're left, do we have any lefties in the group? Yes. Okay, excellent. So as a left-handed person, your nib is going to be generally going the opposite of what I'm describing. So in this case, my, my nib is going to point towards the right-hand side, okay? But you're gonna follow the same concept with it, all right? And if I forget to talk about what direction to point the nib for lefties, just ask, okay? All right, so then your second stroke, so we've got the full pressure stroke and the no pressure stroke, is I want to float on top of the paper. Now, if you'll notice, so for my full pressure stroke, I pointed to the side and worked on the side of the brush. Mm -hmm. For the thin stroke, I am moving my pen more upright, so that way I'm working more on the tip. And I want to just float on the paper. I want to float so much that sometimes it even skips. I might even miss a section 
of my line because I'm writing so lightly. And lots of good things. I really want you to just get the feeling of what it's like, of how delicate that hold is. So go ahead and grab a scrap piece of paper and do some full pressure strokes and some no pressure strokes. Oops. So we'll just do that for a few seconds here. Nope. All right. So how'd that go? Were you able to feel? I'm, there's a huge difference between the two, but sometimes it's really hard to get that float going on the page with it. Okay. But now what I want you to do is to pull out the capital exemplar. Okay. So this capital exemplar is really designed, I made this set of capitals really to practice primarily the first two strokes, the full pressure stroke and the no pressure stroke, okay? Um, so it's a fairly simple lettering style. If you go out on the internet, you'll find all, all sorts of variations on it, okay? Um, but I just wanted to start off where you're combining the different things. You'll also notice that the alphabet is all out of order. So what I've done is they're called letter families. I've put similar letters together. So that way you can try one, move on to the next letter, move on to the next letter. You don't need to do you know, a whole boatload of any one letter. Because even if you were to try doing five or six of any one letter, your best one might be your first, might be your second, but it's usually not your fifth letter, <laughs> okay? So there's no need to repeat any one letter too much, okay? But you'll see that on the I through the F, it is just a combination of full pressure and no pressure strokes. On the K and the M, we have the full pressure and then it's just a diagonal stroke. I want you to try the letters I through D, but then please stop, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and letter if you would like to watch. If you wanna dive right into doing the letters yourself, please go ahead and do that. You can either write on a scrap piece of paper or if you'd like to work on the guidelines for the capitals, this larger space, blank space in between the lines is the space for the capitals. Your X indicates the space for our lowercase letters, okay? So go ahead and give the I through the D a go. Go ahead and start doing those letters. And then after you get through those letters, you can make some short words using you know, the I and the E. And if I get off screen, please um, let me know because sometimes I, I don't always realize when I've gotten off the camera.
So as you make sure you change your how you point your pen as you change between your thicks and your thins. So when I'm doing my thin, my pen is more upright. When I'm doing a thick, it's pointed to the side. And if you have a question at any time, please unmute and ask. That's the beautiful thing of having a live class um, because I can answer your questions as they come mm -hmm. up. So I have a question. Yeah. Uh, is it cheating to use the calligraphy pens, you know, that they have that are angled and short and... The, the flat edge. It, yes. Yeah, you can absolutely do, do that. Um, you're gonna find that it will be a totally different lettering style. You can't necessarily do this lettering style with the broad edge marker. Even if you turn it in your hand, like I, I'm just trying to use both of them tonight, just to... Well, if you're comfortable doing that pen rotation, um, give that a go. That pen rotation is, is pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, I would never want to tell somebody who's doing it that you can't do it. <laughs> right. It's not cheating if you put a lot of love into it. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> I love it. All right. So hopefully you had a chance to try the, the A through the D. And I'm going to keep moving, even if you might not be ready, because I need to make sure we cover. We got a lot of ground to cover over the um, before class is over. So our next letters are the A and the Z. So we have diagonals on these letters. Now, in order to get an, a, a proper thick line for our diagonal, you'll notice there it has this comment up here, point pen to the upper left. So for me and a right-handed person, instead of pointing to the side, for my normal straight up and down stroke. Instead, I'm going to point more up to my upper corner because that way I can still get that consistent thin, thick stroke, okay? And then I'm gonna rotate up onto my point and do my thin across. I'm gonna do that again for the diagonal of the Z. I'm pointing upward instead of to the side. And then I'm, my pen is upright. Okay. Now, um, for those who are lefty, I was pointing up. You're going to point down to the lower right corner. Okay. So that way I will still get that strong thick but I am doing it at an angle that is easy for me to get to, okay? Let me just do the V through the Y real quick here, and then we'll let you practice for a couple minutes. You'll notice on the V, W, X, Y, now our pen point is to the lower left corner. So our diagonal goes from, instead of right to left, now goes from left to right. As our diagonal changes, the way we point the pen also needs to change. So you've got this reminder on your exemplar that now for this next set of letters, my 
brush is pointing down, okay, to the lower corner. So I'm going to go down to the lower corner, down to the lower corner, down to the lower corner, down to the lower corner. Down to the lower corner. Now, for those who are lefty, again, you're working opposite. So um, for the A, I was pointing down to the lower corner, but now I'm going to point to the upper corner. Okay, so I'm gonna point to the upper corner in order to get my diagonal stroke. Okay. So what you can do is if you are lefty, I highly recommend kind of cross these comments out and say for the V, W, X, Y, you want to say 10 points upper, upper right corner. <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> make sure I say it correctly. The upper right corner if you're a lefty. On um, the A and the Z, it was point 10 lower right corner. Okay. All right, so try the diagonal letters. And then we're gonna spend, um, you know, another two, three minutes. But once you've tried all the letters <coughs> in the alphabet, start putting it together in words. We now have um, three vowels. <laughs> so I know you have enough in there to write some actual words for your practice, but don't tackle the taper ones quite yet. You know, and one of the other things is just to keep in mind is that we are surrounded by computer fonts day in and day out. And we, it can create this expectation that with our hand lettering, we need to have that same level of uniformity and I just want to encourage you to let go of that with your hand lettering. Is that allow and celebrate those um, quirks to be what is so awesome about your work tonight? Because um, when I was when I was early on in my calligraphy journey. I just thought it was the biggest compliment in the world to be like, oh, I couldn't tell that that was handwritten. Now it's like, I think I'd cringe if somebody told me that because I would be like, what do you mean? I want you to know it's been handwritten. <laughs> um, so it's one of those situations where it's just like, embrace it. You want people to know that something has been created for them by hand, okay? All right, now drum roll. Let's get to those taper letters, all right? So this is the third kind of stroke and we've been working on the full pressure and the no pressure. Now we're getting into that third stroke of the taper, okay? All right, thank you everybody for your patience. Hopefully you're, um, you might have even have started to experiment with the, the additional, the new stroke of the taper. 
And that's where we go from applying full pressure to gradually lifting up, okay? So we've got full pressure and then we're gradually reducing it. So this is where it gets a little bit trickier as far as making it, um, having it be smooth as far as having it um, alter and change. Changing my board a little bit to get closer to the camera. All right, I think that's a little bit better. Okay, so now for the U through the Q, we've got fully press, release. When I get to the bottom, I really like to fully stop. And then that way, when it comes to my thin, I'm doing it as its own stroke. Because on the full pressure, I'm applying full pressure. But now I have to taper. And in order to go from the taper to the point, I like to lift off. And then I can do the straight of the, the U, okay? We've got the, the J where we've got full pressure. We've got a taper. I go up on my point. So I change the direction of my pen in order to do the thins, okay? And then we've got the S, the letters with the curve taper here, my bottom row, the S C E G O Q, they're different in the fact that I am, you'll notice that the, there's a reminder as to where to point the pen. For the right-handed people, we're gonna point upwards. For the left-handed people, you're gonna point in the opposite direction, okay? So we're going to go full pressure, taper, Again, I like to stop when I change from a taper to a thin. Now I'm slowly adding pressure and then I'm releasing it as I come up into the end of the S. I don't have to do 10 S's because I'm gonna practice that same skill with these other letters. So this is just another variation of the letter E that you can use. Hey, Debbie, I have a, a comment that somebody thinks they're doing something wrong. Okay. They're going thinner on the stroke, it completely cuts off. How can they fix that? So, um, let me see. Is that, ex can you read it exactly how they describe it? Sure, I think I'm doing something wrong. When I'm going thinner on the stroke, it completely cuts off. How can I fix this? Yes, okay. on the sides. On the sides it's cutting off or on the thin it's cutting off? It feels like on the thin it's cutting off. Okay, so then that's the, so what's kind of interesting is that we all have different tendencies some of us have a tendency to be heavy handed and some of us have a tendency to be really light. And so for those of us who are heavy handed, it might be hard to get the delicate, to do the thin line. For those of us who have um, a delicate hand, it might, we might want to float on the paper so much that we're not getting enough of the pen down. You are gonna bend the tip just the tiniest bit when I, um, when I do my thin strokes. So it does bend just a little bit, okay? Give that a try and see if that helps. Feel free to ask again or unmute. All right, so the next thing I want you to do is I want you to grab a plain piece of paper, okay? 
I'm going to hold mine vertically. Okay. And at the very top of my paper, I'm going to just make a little bit of a swirly fence post. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad that helped. So I'm making four full pressure strokes. And then I want to just do some of my no pressure strokes. I'm kind of, like I said, make it a swirly fence post. And then does anybody out there know what a pangram is? Oh, you're being shy if you know it. <laughs> Say it again. What is it? What? A pangram. Pangram. Yep. Pangram. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. We're getting confessions that there's. <laughs> now, what if I were to say, does anybody know what is special about the phrase, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog? It has all the letters of the alphabet or something? Yeah, absolutely. So the quick brown fox sentence is a pangram. So a pangram is a way to practice all the letters of the alphabet. So underneath your fence post here, I want you to write the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog in these set of capitals with this style of letters that we've been doing, okay? Because the lettering isn't any good unless we use it. And one of the things that's really fun is that being able to see that even after just a little bit of practice, we can actually write something with the letters that we're learning. Okay. So, um, And what's nice about this lettering style is that they don't have to be, they actually do better when they're not perfectly straight across and level and even. And no, your kindergarten teacher is not going to see it and they're not gonna say, did you work in your guidelines? No, <laughs> fortunately we don't need to do that. Um, as we are playing with this lettering style. So just in case it, it's not familiar, the sentence is the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And I had no appreciation for this pangram until I assigned it, I was teaching a calligraphy class and I think I was mostly, it was mostly middle school boys for that specific instance. And I told them for homework, they needed to write a pangram and bring it to class the next week. So I was just like, well, if I'm gonna ask them to do it, I need to do it too. <laughs> and I had no idea how hard of an assignment that was. But I also fell in love. I had well, I had a much, much greater appreciation for the brilliance of the quick brown fox. Because there's very few letters that repeat. As far as pangrams out in the world, this one makes more sense than most. <laughs> And so it um, is really a very brilliant sentence.
The other thing to keep in mind is that even though this lettering style might look like it's done quickly, is to just realize that, and this is pretty much applies for everything in calligraphy in the lettering world, is that the slower you go, the faster you learn. So if you're moving slowly tonight, that's totally awesome. If you're moving fast with your letters, I might encourage you to slow down because by moving slowly, it enables my fine muscles to be able to connect with my neurons. And it just gives time for the body to process all the information that's going through. It allows me time to really see where I want my writing tool to go. What direction am I pointing in? How am I holding my pen? Am I upright? Am I sideways? Am I, you know, it really allows me to be deliberate with every step that I'm doing. Okay. All right. My apologies if you're not quite yet done with your quick brown fox, but I want to talk a little bit how even though we are just getting started on our lettering journey, we can add color to it and we can have fun with it. And one of the things I love about adding color when I'm learning a lettering style is that, well, if my letters aren't quite what I want them to be, <laughs> the color component is a really nice distraction. Okay, it adds a whole nother dimension to it. And so if there's imperfections, I get to kind of overlook those things. So in the course of my quick brown box, I'm going to show you four techniques. Okay, so we're going to do four little techniques. I'm just doing them with highlighters. Nothing fancy. You can do them with colored pencils, um, marker, um, something that would just be a contrast to it. So the first one is just to add a line through the text. Now, I often like to have a second one, and then I can, a second highlighter color is fun because then I can do these little squares and it ends up feeling like a little bit of confetti coming down into the letters itself. So I just use the flat edge of the, um, of the highlighter in order to get the decorative marks, okay? So that's one idea. The second idea is to color in the counters. Now, the counters in the calligraphy world are these areas that have been enclosed by the lines of the letter, okay? So we have them on the B and the R for this line, the O. And this is from, this is a technique that was used in 800. This is a very common technique used by the monks who were writing the Book of Kells. They would simply add circles of color inside their letter forms. And so as precious as pigments were, they realized that that touch of color inside our counters of our letter made for beautiful design, okay? And then if you want to do the other kinds of decorative techniques in the Book of Kells is lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of dots, okay? I think, Somebody actually took the time to count all the red dots that are in the Book of Kells and it was in the millions. <laughs> um, now the fourth technique is to simply add color behind your letter. Because even though you can see a little bit how my marker might be bleeding into the background, again, 
that's what shows that it's been done by hand. So don't be afraid of those kind of um, interactions between your paper and your mediums, okay? So, all right. And then the fourth technique is to add a shadow to our letters. I always have a tendency to keep my, my light source consistent, okay? So I like to keep my light source from the upper left. That way I'm consistently making my shadow on the right hand side. I can make a thick shadow where I'm just using the whole side of the marker. Now that ends up making it feel like it's got a little bit of dimension, right? It's almost like it's got, you know, and it's got an actual um, shadow going to it. Another type of shadow is one where it's just a quick line. And a shadow like this ends up making it feel like it's got motion, okay? It just ends up feeling like it's moving quickly. You know, like on a cartoon, if somebody wants to make, you know, the art, artist wants to make it feel like it's in motion, it's adding these quick lines on either side, right? Though I guess I shouldn't be putting motion lines on the lazy dog. I should have done that on the fox. <laughs> All right. So I want to make sure. Um, so these are techniques that you can add to your practice, to your quick brown fox. Um, but I want to make sure we get to the lowercase letters. Okay, so I am going to now switch to this exemplar. Okay, so we're moving on to this one. You'll notice at the top, okay, we've got a reminder, maybe for some of us, it's been a long time since we've done cursive. Um, you do not have to have your letters linked if you do not want to, um, but this is just a reminder of your basic um, Palmer cursive, which is fundamentally the skeleton that we are using here. And at the top row here, you'll notice these aren't even letters. These are just the basic strokes that when combined together, <laughs> they will actually make letters. Okay, so we're going to separate them out just briefly into the separate strokes before we put them, combine them and put them together into letters. Again, by being able to practice the individual strokes, it makes it easier for us to um, combine all the skills at once. So the first stroke is called the connecting stroke and that we've been doing, right? That's our floating stroke, okay? The next stroke is where we start with the full pressure. We did that with the U and with the U, right? I like to stop there so that way I can turn my pen and come up with my thin. So I rotate, I release, and then I change my pen angle. The third stroke is where I go thin, and then I add a taper, and then I go to full pressure. I can do that a little bit bigger. I am thin, and I am gradually adding pressure. So we've got, you know, the taper that's happening as we move the pen. Now we've got the combination of these two strokes. Now I'm doing a thin, I'm tapering, full pressure, I'm releasing, I'm gonna lift off so that way I can get a proper thin. This last stroke is our dots. We have several letters that have these tiny pressure strokes in them. The R is one of them. We're going to 
If you'll notice, the dot is above your guideline, okay? So this might be the height of my letter, but I wanna go above it and then add my pressure stroke. There's my dot. Now I'm back at the top of the, the height of the letter and then I can press, pressure, taper, and then release. So let me do those that dot again for you. So we've also got the dot on the S where we're coming up. I'm above, I'm higher than the guideline. I'm pressing, but I'm stopping because now I wanna go thin, pressure, thin. And then I'm gonna rotate up to have a thick, a thin extra stroke. I see that dot on the W. Now I'm at the very end. My connecting stroke is gonna be a high connecting stroke. So I've got my pressure and then I'm going to come out the side, okay? So what I want you to do is try all the letters between I and Z, okay? Work on the letters between I and Z. If you could hold off on the bottom row, we'll do those together in um, five minutes or so, five or 10 minutes. I want you guys to practice the I through the Z first. If you want to see, um, if you would like to see the different letters, I will be writing them. If you wanna jump right in, please do so. And again, you're working in letter families, so don't feel like you need to do any one letter more than once. You'll be able to practice that same, a similar skill with the next letter. And just remember, these are markers. So I'm not gonna be able to create my Mona Lisa with a felt tip marker. So these are a wonderful tool to start and get going with, but realize that there is gonna be, a, just because of the medium, there's gonna be a limit to how precise I can get with this tool. Are we using the same pen as you are? You might be using a slightly different brand. I am using um, a Tombow. Um, it seems to, yours seems to be you know, flowing so nicely. That's. Well, some of that's the distance of the, <laughs> that's the, I'll call that the internet effect. <laughs> So some of it is um, just the fact that you can't see my imperfections as well as you can see your own imperfections on the paper in front of you. Mm. I am a big fan of the Tombow marker. If it's something that you decide you want to continue exploring, um, and it's read, readily available at almost all the craft stores. <clears throat> and the other thing too is that um, if you have like a watercolor palette, 
you know, just getting, so um, a Tombow marker costs about $3, between three and $4. And a water brush um, is costs about between seven and nine, depending upon your source. And this one can last for years. So as far as an investment for your money, if you have a watercolor set, you can just be doing it, you know, with something like this, and then it'll, it will last a very long time. If you want to see any specific letters, please don't hesitate to unmute and ask. Can you point out which structures, which parts of the letters are parallel? as you make them, please? Ah, yes. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, because this lettering style is actually based off of the oval, okay? Instead of a circle, which means that by having the base shape of an oval, we have things where, you know, the M feels like a really round letter, but in order to get that oval shape, I want to have that um, sense of these side lines on my M are actually parallel to another. Okay, and we see that even on like the letter S, where if you think about it, the S is inside those diagonals. The S, the bowl of this S doesn't swoop out here and then come back. It stays inside those parallel lines. Um, forgive me if this is sounding too technical, but like, K is another great example because the K, we often think of it as having this kick out, okay? But in order to keep to that oval core shape, we need to have this part of the K parallel the stem stroke. Is there, is there practice pads that have this built in? Um, what you can do is, so you've got this. My, my favorite recommendation, if you're struggling with any of this, take a piece of paper, cheap, you know, copy paper, and then work right on top of the lines or the letters. So that's one way to be able to practice and kind of develop that. Um, you're creating that muscle memory. You know, you'll eventually figure out your own style and what your preferences are for it. But when you copy initially, what you're learning to do is you're developing, what do my muscles need to be doing in order to get those certain shapes or sizes or things like that. So copying initially is a great way for me to be able to develop control over the pen as opposed to the pen having control over me. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I'm just fooling around, I might be able to create some really fun letters, but if I have no idea how I did it, I'll never be able to recreate it, okay? Um, so learning how to 
do those skills initially. Um, again, I'm a big fan of tracing for developing those skills. Um, all right, you guys are jumping at the bit probably to get to that last line of letters. Um, all right, so on this last line of letters, you'll notice that we've got the brush pointing upwards. Okay, again, for the lefties, you can reverse it and have the um, brush pointing the opposite way to the lower right corner. Okay, now with this tool, I can do a tiny push and it's going to be okay. Normally, we don't want to push our writing tool. Um, in this case, we really don't have a choice on it. So I'm going to push it and then taper it. I'm going to lift up because again, I find it's easier if I stop at the end of my taper. I'm at the end of my taper. I'm going to lift up and I'm going to come around. That's the first time I did it. I did it slow. And you can see I've got, you know, ragged edges here. This is, these are your hardest strokes. All right. So be patient with this as you try this row of letters. And again, realize that in time it will happen, but these are a challenging set of letters. Um, and the other thing too, is that no matter how you feel about the lettering tonight, please make sure that you try it again tomorrow. It is really amazing what happens when the brain and the body has a chance to rest and process the challenge you presented to it tonight, okay? So even if you're just like, oh, that was horrible. I never want to do that again. Try it again tomorrow. You might really surprise yourself that even though this was really hard, tomorrow, it might just be a little bit easier. There might be a lot of things that still don't quite work right, but if you're persistent with it and come back to it time and again, you're gonna find that almost just, it, to me, it's just miraculous <laughs> where the brain and the body and the muscles are figuring out how to do these fine motor skills, okay? So just be patient with them. All right, so now hopefully you guys have tried or, or have almost touched all the letters of the alphabet, and I want you to start putting them in words. You know, for those of you who might have kids out there, this is a great activity for, you know, to do with your kids. Um, once kids have a chance to learn how to hold a pen or a pencil, they can also play around with applying this pressure and lightness. Um, it's really astonishing what kids are capable of if we just give them the chance and the challenge. I, because I'm a homeschool mom, I've had a chance to teach calligraphy to a lot of kids over the years. Um, of course, my son's a bit of an extreme example because he's the, 
<laughs> he's stuck with me as a calligrapher. But um, so, but he was writing, you know, letters with the broad edge nib when he was five. It was because we were in a, a class of older boys. And obviously he didn't do as many letters as they did, but he was still able to go through the experience of learning how to hold the pen and create letters. And I've just been blown away constantly over the years how um, young people love the challenge of the lettering. You know, they really, um, it's almost like there's a craving for it in a world full of computer font. It's a lot of fun to be able to create something that's different and unique. Um, What is, what's your latest project that you're working on? Ah, that's a great question. Um, I had, um, my latest project was actually yesterday. I had a chance to go down to Westerly, Rhode Island. <laughs> um, there's a, um, and it, yeah, this is totally your neighborhood. It was um, Gray's, Gray's is a, a basically a fast food <laughs> burger joint that has had me do their chalkboards. So I went and did an update of their chalkboards yesterday. Um, so, uh, and the, the cattle is raised right next door in Stonington. So it's grass fed beef. I'm a, I'm a foodie <laughs> and I love locally grown food and organic food and stuff like that. So I really admire what Gray's is doing in West, Westerly Rhode Island. Um, so, but yeah, that was one project and um, my goodness, what have other projects been? Diplomas. Um, have been another piece. Commissions are a big part of what I do. Um, teaching, I do teach um, in-depth classes, six-week classes, as well as um, I've developed over six library programs um, on different components of calligraphy. So since I've been doing calligraphy for 20 years, I kind of do whatever it takes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you do it very well. Thank you so much. Well, you're very sweet. I wanted to. Um... There's a question in the chat too, Debbie. Oh, okay. Um, okay, let me from see. Carrie, me... for those with arthritic hands, do you think the eggs that go on pens would get in the way of the movements required in the clip? No, I'm a big fan of making the pen fatter. Um, in all honesty, I had a early on in my calligraphy journey. I was in Chicago. And um, I was doing a lot of invitations, <laughs> a lot of envelopes um, for the bar and bat mitzvahs and for weddings and special events. And there was one day where I woke up and my hand was not moving. <laughs> my muscles were like, we're done, that's it. Um, and so I had to learn uh, a couple things. One is that when I hold my pens and my pencils, I'm working only one side of my muscles. So um, because I'm squeezing, every set of muscles has two parts, the pulling in and the pulling out. And so what I had to learn to do would be to exercise my pulling out muscles. So what I did is I would put a rubber band around my fingertips, and then I would exercise my stretching muscles. So that was a way for me to be able to create balance in my hand. Um, the other thing I just needed to learn to stop and take breaks. <laughs> and then the most important thing is what you're referring to is where I fattened up my nib holders. So here's one where you can see, so it's, it's not exactly the same, but underneath is just a, you know, 
um, a pen holder about this width. And I've taken um, rubber tubing from the hardware store and then the soft loopy side of the Velcro. And so by making my holder thicker, I'm not stressing those holding muscles as much um, for it. So um, there's, there's ways to alleviate the strain on the muscles for it. I hope that wasn't too much information. <laughs> All right, I want to just talk briefly about using this, okay? Because again, don't be shy. The cool thing about the modern calligraphy is that you're probably not going to write a really long text. You know, the modern calligraphy, you're likely to just do a word or two. You know, if you, now that you're doing the modern calligraphy, you'll find it everywhere. You know, it's very common in advertisements <coughs> um, nowadays. I see it on the internet in various different forms. So there's, it's, it's there. And what's nice is that I don't have to write out 10 or 20 words and get it looking correct. But by just using a couple of words, and this is the simple um, capitals in our, the beginning of our class, we can create something simple. You know, this is just a single piece of, you know, heavy paper. I think this brown and white was from a magazine cover. I save paper, you know, I like save bits of interesting paper or, you know, um, gift wrap or things like that. You know, this was an annual, re annual report from a nonprofit. This was a watercolor that didn't turn out so good. You know, I, but by putting them all together, I have a lovely card. And I, to me, when you, when I give a card like this, it says way more than any Hallmark card can <laughs> because it shows the person that it's, you know, my love and my care is so big. I took the time to make something for you. You know, and that's what I love about things like this. Again, these are just little scraps of paper that are out there. Here's, I'll start with this one. Again, these are just the simple capitals that we were doing um, on an envelope. This is just creating flicks with your pressure. So at the beginning, I press down the point and then I flick it out and release the pressure. And that's how I create kind of these little fireworks. Okay. And then envelopes are a wonderful way. I don't have to write out the whole address um, on an envelope. I can just do somebody's name or somebody's initials. This is done with the um, Tombow marker and a little bit of colored pencil shaded in, it's not complicated, but it is fun. And then one other thing, even if you found the tapers challenging, okay? I wanna show you this little um, note I got from a very accomplished calligrapher. Her name's Margaret Susie. And, you know, I, I know, I know it was just a quick card that she was sending to me, but what I love about this is that, look how lovely that is, but she's keeping her, the, um, her lines mostly a consistent thick. She's not even doing the thicks and thins. And look at how lovely those letters are. You know, she's using that technique of putting the baseline down adding color around it. And then she's even taken like a little really delicate black pen and created an outline around that. So you can do a lot of fun lettering, even if that taper just drives you nuts. You know, you can <laughs> still um, have fun with the lettering, develop your skills, get comfortable with the tool and be able to go places with it. So um, I realize I've, managed to 
take up just about every minute of the 90 minutes. <laughs> so thank you everybody for hanging in there. I'm happy to stay and answer questions, um, but I also want to respect everybody's time as well. It was fabulous, Debbie. Thank you so much for sharing your talent. And I just, I forgot in the beginning, I need to give a shout out to our Circle of Friends group. It's our friends of the library who support programming like this by having book sales. There's another one in June and uh, really you know, helping us to offer these programs to the community. So this was awesome. I know I need to practice some more, but I may have been inspired. So thank you. I don't know if anybody else has anything to say to Debbie, you can uh, unmute and share. Yes, just thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so happy. I love the library. I love everything the library provides for us. And this has been really um, exciting and fun. Thank you. Come in, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been very nice. Thank you. Absolutely. So glad to join us. I, I have a question about what brand of pens is your favorite. Um, again, if you need to go, don't be, you know, I totally respect that too. I'm going to show you, through, um, I'm going to, this water brush is my favorite because you can do a lot with it. Um, my next favorite is what's called a Pentel color brush. And this is another one that's been around for more than 10 years. In this case, it's a lot like the color brush. Okay. A lot like the water brush. Sorry, a lot like this one. But in this case, this barrel is full of a color, okay? What's wonderful is that even after that color runs out, I can either refill it with a fountain pen ink or it's got the same bristles as the water brush. So even though my color has run out a long time ago, it's still a really good lettering tool. Again, that's for, you know, if you have to have either an ink or use a watercolor palette or something, you do have to have a source of your, your mm -hmm. color on that. Um, as far as markers, I, I do really like the Tombow dual brush marker. Um, as you could see from my demonstrations tonight, it leaves a pretty strong line. So you can't necessarily do small letters with it or small letters are a little bit harder. If you want to do smaller letters, Tombow has a, a marker called, ooh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm putting it in the the chat, Fudenosuku, <laughs> forgive me if I don't have that correct. Um, but that is a marker that is has a much smaller tip. And so if you'd like to do small lettering, that's a great one for that. Okay. Hmm. But there are tons and tons of brands. Um, my favorite calligraphy source is John Neal Books, and um, they are a calligraphy specialty supplier. And so they have a number of brush pens and markers, and they've vetted, there's a lot of brands out there, but they've taken the best of the best. So if you want to have somebody else have done all the research <laughs> about what good brushes are and markers are, the John Neal Books is a great source for that. Thank you again, Debbie. This was, mm -hmm. fun. This was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, all the library programs are up on their website. So. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Take care.